This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Go to our website at wdtatpodcast.com and click on support to learn how you can be part of this effort to learn how to have better conversations, increase compassion, and build bridges, not walls. You can make a one-time donation or become a patron for as little as $1 a month and receive patron-only benefits. Thanks to all of our patrons at any level for your support. You are what makes this happen and what makes this possible. Thank you. Now let's get into the interview. This is part two of my conversation with Steve McDonald about spiral dynamics. In this episode, we make the leap from tier one to tier two and talk about what the heck that means. If you haven't listened to part one yet, you might want to listen to it first since we're picking up where we left off last week. Welcome to the podcast where we talk about things we're not supposed to, learn how to have difficult conversations, and talk to people about what makes them different. This is the We Don't Talk About That with Lucas Land podcast where we do talk about that with me, Lucas Land. It's never the right place or time. It's imperceptible to the eye. It's never the right place or time. Anyways, okay, could continue with the spiral. Sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and and um, just to comment briefly on what you said, if we look back at history, we'll find that these the duration of these value systems is getting gradually shorter and shorter and shorter as we progress. Yeah. So we lived for mm. the longest time as hunter gatherers and then tribal yeah. our tribal existence maybe goes back 50,000 years. And, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, look at the next thing I'm going to talk about is the scientific industrial era, which is uh, orange layer five, which Claire Graves called multiplistic. Um, And he called it multiplistic because the way of thinking involves looking at multiple options and then choosing the best option in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that only started, you know, some 300 years ago. So, and it's just coming to an end, end now. And, and mm-hmm. if this same pattern continues, then the next value system that we're moving into now is going to be even shorter. So, um, so the transition out of four communally themed and into five, which is individually themed, um, it lasted quite a long time, the transition period, but some of the main sort of milestones were the scientific and industrial revolutions and, and also the European Enlightenment were sort of key ways of change that brought us into the to the fifth layer orange. Uh, and mm-hmm. so most people will be very familiar with this because with this one, because it's basically mainstream life in a lot of the world at the moment. It's the, it's the rat race, mm-hmm. you know, it's the strive drive mm-hmm. existence. It's the mainstream economy where you've got to have enough money to be able to survive in the world and you've got to work to get the money. Um, it, uh, and it's, it's, it comes in for a lot of criticism right at the moment because we're, many of us are moving into what's next the, the sixth system and we're looking back and rejecting you know the scientific industrial world and saying wow it's bad you know mm. but of course when mm-hmm. it first emerged it was really really good and it transformed life you know from sort of the middle ages onwards uh, and took mm-hmm. us out of that sort of dark uh, agricultural existence that was happening at the tail end of, of layer four um, mm-hmm. so there have been lots of good things about orange it's got us to the moon and back for example um, so it's a relatively complex way of problem solving that's allowed us to leave the planet. Uh, and of course, there've been all sorts of amazing breakthroughs in science uh, and our understanding of the world and ourselves. Um, it's it has played its uh, its path out though. So we've you know we've seen the peak of it, and because the world is beginning, it is becoming more complex. Uh, the the um, capacity of this way of being human to solve our problems has declined sharply and is continuing to right at the moment. So we're seeing a lot of our social mm-hmm. systems that have been dev- designed from the scientific industrial mind, you know, like our economy, our political system, those sorts of things are not working so well anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and that pressure is driving us to what's next. And what's next is back to another communal system, uh, the sixth or green layer uh, or 
value system and Claire Graves called this one relativistic because it involves the development of the capacity to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And so you, you know, the world is a relative place. Mm -hmm. Truth is a relative thing. Um, and, uh, and you can see that playing out quite strongly, uh, at a global scale at the moment, you know, I, I put us, if, if I was to sort of generalize, I'd say as a species from a planetary level, we're kind of maybe approaching the halfway point in the transition between orange, the scientific industrial era and uh, green layer six, mm -hmm. this uh, postmodern or relativistic era. And if the time uh, pattern holds, then this green layer is probably only going to last a couple of decades before we make this huge mm. leap into second tier consciousness on a, on a global scale. Yeah. Mm. So, um, so the last, uh, system in the first tier of consciousness, layer six green, uh, sometimes called postmodern graves called it relativistic. It's, um, it's a very interesting layer because, it's it's kind of like the bookend on first tier existence. So part of what comes with this mm -hmm. layer is a tendency to look back at our whole life, to take stock of uh, our life, and kind mm -hmm. of attend to anything that we that needs healing within us. And some of those things might mm -hmm. be associated with previous layers, you know. So maybe we've got family issues, mm -hmm. which which are from our layer two existence, and we've got to go back and kind of fix those. You know, maybe we've got uh, power issues from layer three left over that we didn't quite resolve when we were living through layer three. And so part of layer six mm. uh, is, is a very strong healing motivation uh, at a personal level and also at a planetary level, mm -hmm. you know, where everyone's looking at the yeah. planet and say, well, we've got to heal the planet as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what we're seeing on a planetary level is a, a theme of relocalization. So power was centralized in the scientific industrial layer, layer five, and now power is being decentralized in this communal layer six. So you can see that as uh, the effectiveness of our centralized governments decreasing. That's one of the drivers, of course, and people are looking mm. to rebuild local community. That's a really, really strong theme and also to resource themselves locally again. So you're seeing the emergence of uh, locally grown organic food, you know, so people can know where their food has come from, know that it's, it's not poisoned with chemicals. Mm -hmm. um, they can trust the supplier. Mm -hmm. um, people are looking to generate their own energy locally as well. You know, there really is a kind of a self-sufficient local village um, theme happening. Um, yeah. And at the same time, on a global scale, we've got this global village <laughs> emerging emerging as well through the benefit of our social media technology, where the world's become a much smaller place. You know, we can have tri members of our family, you know, maybe they're not blood family, but mm -hmm. they feel like family anyway, who are spread right around the world. And we can talk to them just like we can talk to people that we're in the presence of um, through our social mm -hmm. media. So same thing playing out. Um, this value system is very network centric. So it's very much about building a trusted network and operating within a trusted network. Um, it has a, a tendency to want to flatten hierarchies. So it, um, that's really a, a rejection of the previous system, five, which built hierarchies and those hierarchies became dominating and unfair. And as a result of that, mm -hmm. there's a reaction to want to bust them down and make everything flat, make everything a level playing field, give everybody equal rights, equal access, mm -hmm. equal benefits. Um, yeah. and make this kind of flat social structure. Yeah. Well, so before we jump to, to tier two, I, I really like what you're saying about green. Looking back, thinking of it as an individual's life, I think is helpful maybe to take it out of judging, judging others a little bit, but like looking back on your life and what things, mistakes you've made and how you've grown and changed. And on the social level, it does seem, you know, Today in the U.S., uh, as we're recording, is Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, and so it's a big holiday in the U.S., and I've seen all these memes on Facebook today quoting uh, MLK and also pointing out ways that he's misquoted, etc. And there seems to be a real energy behind looking back at our history and tr really trying to name and unpack those things that weren't so great in in 
uh, other as we were developing uh, and naming those things. And it just made me think of that when you were saying that green really um, reflects back on what came before. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. It's very true. And, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, history being revised at the moment as well for that reason. Mm. You know, people are looking back yeah. on things from a different perspective. And, of course, history is always written at the time by whoever's, you know, dominant in society. Right. Um, so, yeah. And it's very much flavored by the value system that they're looking through. Yeah. yeah, and I think what happens is when we're looking, we've looked back but we also real recognize that not everybody is necessarily at that same level of green or understanding. And so now we're looking back at uh, some blue and orange that's sort of taken, taken over and uh, had, had a bit of a resurgence. And also we see that in the previous history. And so now there's almost this, as I was saying before about green, how some, some people have said, that green kind of holds this danger almost of being stuck <laughs> where we, we think we've arrived yeah. because now we're looking back and we're seeing uh, the problems throughout history and the other ways of looking at things. And we see the people who maybe are, are still operating in those, those uh, different ways or different layers. And well, we, we know that they're wrong. And so we just need them to understand where we're at and get to where we are. And they don't <laughs> when we, when we try to explain it to them, right? Like, yeah, yeah exactly. It seems, yeah. It's it, to me, it's a little bit comical because it, it's, it, it's almost a, an inability to understand this whole process that if somebody is in that other place, you're not going to move them anywhere by just looking back and going, yeah, but you're wrong. <laughs> you, uh, exactly. You don't have yeah. it, right? <laughs> like, yeah. 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 So, you know, it comes back to their life conditions. That's the, the ultimate driver. Um, right. Just Which to, maybe leads us to the, to the leap to the second tier. I don't know. Yeah. yeah go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to add just a, a couple of little nuances about the first tier. So the, the communal systems to tribal for um, agricultural or absolutistic and then, six uh, postmodern, the communal systems are where we form our ethical frameworks because they're all about community. And mm -hmm. when you're living in a community, you've got to have agreements on, on ethics, right? Yeah. The, the individual systems, uh, one, three, and five, tend to bust out of that and they're mostly about breaking the rules. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's mm -hmm. when we're in the individual systems, our, our perspective is... Uh, one of wanting to change the outside world to fit with what we want or need. Okay. And when we're in mm -hmm. the communal systems, the perspective is wanting to change ourselves to fit with what the world requires of us. So, so you get that alternating dynamic and, and part of the reason why um, the, the emerging postmodern looks a little comical and, and seems a bit silly is uh, there's a new ethical framework developing and people want to, they want the world to instantly change to fit with, with what they're feeling. Um, but it's really, it's not within the, the capacity of a communal system to bring about global change like that. That's the role of the individual mm. systems, you know, to historically mm. anyway. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. <clears throat> so really the, yeah. most people wouldn't understand this, but the primary role of, of the postmodern era is to change who we are internally change our values and change our understanding of ourselves uh, and to, yeah. prepare, to prepare for the next individual system, which is of course the leap in the second tier. Yeah. So, okay, well let's leap. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so Claire Graves described the change between layer six and layer seven as a momentous leap. And when he looked at his data, he, he looked at the magnitude of change that happened between layers one, two, three, four, five, and six and it was relatively uniform in terms of the, the scope of mm -hmm. the change. But the change mm -hmm. in coping capacity between six and seven was off the scale, like, like seriously off the scale. And he wrote that there's more coping capacity in seven alone than there is in all of the first six added together. It, it's like it mm -hmm. really is a quantum leap we're talking about here. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, he... He also uh, described uh, the shift from first tier to second tier as most likely being the most difficult shift that we've ever been through as well. It's kind of like I often talk about uh, uh, 
a slingshot, uh, uh, sort of in a metaphorical sense, like you've got to pull the elastic mm-hmm. band backwards and put a whole lot of tension on it to mm-hmm. make the, the stone or whatever it is go forward, right? And mm-hmm. we, we see this slingshot dynamic in the change between the systems that we go through. So for this change in the second tier, we've got to pull that slingshot uh, back way, way further than we had before. There's a whole lot more tension mm-hmm. is needed in order to shoot us, you know, so far up in the second tier. And so that's why when we look at the world at the moment, we see all this massive tension developing and all of these problems that are bigger than any problems that we've had before uh, are developing. And, and that's tied in very much with this transition into second tier. And it's what will drive the transition into second tier consciousness. So I guess one of the major differences between first tier and second tier is when we pop into yellow layer seven, um, for the first time we have left and right brains operating in an integrated way. So the left and right brain hemispheres, I mean, uh, operating in an integrated way. Whereas in the first tier, that individual versus communal alternation that we get between the systems is the result of the mm-hmm. dominate the domination of left brain for individual living or the domination of right brain for communal living so we've got that that switching between left brain right brain re- left brain right brain and then when we pop in a second mm-hmm. tier all of a sudden the two hemispheres synchronize and it's mm-hmm. that it's that synchronization which is partially responsible for the improvement in coping capacity um, so we can, basically we can think about two things at once and it gives us the capacity to hold paradox uh, and work with paradox. Whereas in first tier, if we look at a paradox, it, it's, it's, it kind of blows our mind <laughs> trying to, trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. Another thing that happens in the shift in the second tier is that uh, our entanglement with the first six value systems falls away uh, is greatly reduced so it's like in the first tier every time we grow into a new value system we're filling our cup up a little further and by the time we get to layer six the cup's full and almost overflowing and we've got you know our mind is full of survival issues family issues power issues you know, um, living righteously in issues around that, following the rules, mm-hmm. you know, succeeding in a world that's competitive and then, you know, fitting into a, a, um, a loving community and being liked and accepted within community and connecting deeply with people. And, and we've got all of that happening all at once in our system. Um, and that's, that's why the cup eventually overflows and it's that overflowing that makes us transform into a bigger cup. <laughs> Uh, in second mm-hmm. tier and mm-hmm. so moving into second tier all of that busyness and um, engagement entanglement falls away and it creates a massive psychological space that's free basically so uh, everything seems simpler easier um, and we look back on first tier and wonder you know wow um, how was I ever caught up in all that stuff so much you know it's, it's, so it's very freeing mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a great feeling of mm-hmm. freedom to move into second tier And uh, layer seven is the first time where we can inherently um, sense and observe value systems operating in other people. So when we're in the first tier, we bump into somebody who's operating from a different value system. They just seem strange, weird, maybe wrong, you know, in their way of living Mm -hmm. life. But in, in layer seven, we see that, okay, these people are just operating on a different frequency than me. And, and incidentally, um, thinking of these value systems as frequencies is a really good way to, uh, to understand them and, mm. and sort of uh, mm-hmm. make sense of them. So, so we can, suddenly we can sense all these different frequencies from the previous value systems. And when we meet somebody, we can directly sense their frequency and, and understand, okay, they're coming from this particular value set. And we also develop a kind of shape-shifting capacity where we can meet them where they're at. You know, so, so we, we, we mm. read their frequency, we understand what their frequency, we've got it inside us because we live through it. We can switch down to it consciously and we can, we can interact with them from their frequency, which uh, is a, an amazing tool for resolving conflict. Um, yeah. You know, and, and this, yeah. this um, transition through six to seven will basically bring the capacity for us to live peacefully with each other. Um, it's just mm. a, matter, a matter of like getting everybody through the, 
through the change process eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so some other characteristics of seven are that there's this, there's this multidimensional awareness that opens up. And part of that is this capacity to sense the different value systems as frequencies in people. Um, and we also open up to, to spiritual dimensions as well. And, and there's a movement now towards the integration of science and spirituality, which is very much driven by this layer seven mindset. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we might not kind of have the a fully formed picture of it in layer seven, but we know that it's possible. We kind of recognize that, okay, all that religious and spiritual stuff, it's actually just interdimensional reality. <laughs> Um, mm. and, 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 you know, we, at layer seven, we go about trying to form a cohesive understanding of that. Um, and layer seven is very much, uh, it's, it's like waking up as a baby in a new world and, and, you know, soaking in a new world because everything looks different to us. Um, and Claire, mm. Claire Graves wrote that it really is a new beginning. It's a, it's a whole new beginning over again for humanity in second tier. And instead of being driven by survival, which is primarily, um, you know, the, the major thing right through the first tier. How do I survive in the world? Um, in second tier, that switches to who am I being in the world? So he mm -hmm. called the second tier uh, being, uh, being layers, being stages instead of survival stages. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, even though we're operating with an integrated brain, left, right hemisphere integration, there's still an individual flavor to layer seven so that doesn't go away mm. that general flavoring it's just less extreme um mm -hmm. and then and then uh layer eight um turquoise uh intuitive some people call it is the uh, most complex communal system that graves documented he said quite openly he didn't have enough people in his his uh, participant set to really uh analyze it Effectively, he only mm -hmm. had out of 1,065 people that he studied, he only had six people who ended up changing into layer eight during the time of his uh, research. Mm. And so uh, all he could do was just, you know, write a few sort of sketchy words about it. He said it, it seemed very spiritually oriented. Um, it, it sort of fits with uh, the concept of the noosphere, which comes from the work of a Jesuit priest called Pierre Teilhard de Chardin who wrote a lot mm -hmm. about consciousness and he described a layer of consciousness around the whole planet. So in the same way that we have like a, an atmosphere and an ionosphere, he described this uh, noosphere, he called it, which is a, a layer of consciousness wrapped around the planet. And um, whereas layer six is, is uh, working within networks, layer eight taps into this noosphere like it's a kind of sophisticated internet uh, and tunes mm. and tunes into it. So um, it, it, again, you know, there's no real good clear descriptions of this in writing yet, but my sense of it is that uh, we're tapping into um, what people in the new age community are calling the fifth dimension. So it's that same mm. experience of getting access to information and connection between us that we haven't had access to before. Um, you know, literally adding an extra dimension to our existence. Um, whereas uh, layer seven, I see with all the you know all the um, compounding challenges that we're facing globally, and the clear lack of capacity to solve those problems right now, I see layer seven as kind of being like the first responders on the accident scene, as you know, as mm -hmm. enough people pop into mm. second tier at layer seven and they can network effectively globally and bring the resources together. They're going to do a triage on humanity and the planet and say, okay, what do we need to fix urgently here? And, and they're going to mm. rapidly change things, you know, in order to allow the continuation of, of uh, human life in particular on the planet. Um, by the time we get to eight, eight is about stability. And this is the case for all of the communal systems. So the, the um, one, three, five, seven, the individual oriented systems, they change the world. Often that can be a, mm -hmm. you know, a kind of fast and chaotic process. Um, look at the scientific industrial era as an example. Um, and then the communal systems that even numbers, they bring stability. So they kind of say, okay, we've done that now. Let's settle down. Let's document some procedures, you know, get a, get some ethics that we all agree on and let's bring some stability to this. 
And that's going to be the, the task of layer eight in second tier is bringing that global stability. Uh, and it will be a new and very sophisticated form of, of uh, global society. And um, yeah, that's, you know, that's really as, as much as we can say based on, I, I'm even extending, yeah. I'm extending Grace's understanding a little bit there through you know, sure. my, my own experience and other research. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if you have the same experience, but as you, as you were kind of going through the layers and explaining them, and I'm taking notes in sort of an outline format, I'm still seeing them in a linear sort of order. And so I switched to uh, look at the image that has, uh, it's an image uh, I'm sure you've seen. It's got kind of people at each layer uh, with different sort of illustrating them and they're all, but they're all nested and it, it's a habit of our brains because it's the way we've kind of been trained and taught to think yeah. in terms of sort of linear progression. Uh, it's really, I hope people are still looking at the image or using that image to really understand what um, Steve's talking about. Because when, when I went, I looked at the image and, and suddenly went, Oh yes. Okay. That it it's nested, right? So turquoise isn't apart and separate and, and somewhere else from all of the other layers it doesn't detach no, I, and we tend to think of it that way don't we like uh, yeah part of the it's problem still with, a uh, habit of the brain it, it yeah. is yeah that's very true and also part of the issue is that there are so many different aspects to the arrangement of human consciousness how it's structured that you can't represent them mm-hmm. all in one drawing you know sure. so, so the linear yeah. drawings are kind of useful for understanding the progression um, the nested right. drawing is really useful for understanding how, you know, these are not discrete things. It's, they're just new layers that get added to what's already there. Um, mm. and, um, and then I, if you're looking at a 2d image, you're still missing that spiral aspect that really, um, exactly includes yeah. moving, moving up and down. And it's not a, it's not just a one way thing either. Yeah. It's, and it's, you know, it's, I've been thinking for years about how to make a single image that captures all of this stuff, and I haven't found a way yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a lot to put in one image. I it mean, is. we should kind of give give the two D image a break. Like, it's hard to put all of this into one. Yeah, one you it, know perfect image. It, it is. Yeah, I'll at the um, end of end of the podcast, I'll give you a link to a talk I did in Switzerland in 2018, um, which is gives a basic introduction to the model and talks a bit about the transition that the world's going through at the moment. And I'm using a nested image yeah. in that presentation there. So people can, can look cool. at that. Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, that was fantastic. That was so much information and, and really, really well uh, explained clearly. And, and I really appreciate you taking the time to go through all of that. Um, I have one more question before we kind of do our uh, wrap up questions for you. What are in any system um, you know, there's so many different systems out there for personalities or for, as you, you know, we're saying before, Claire Graves was looking at five different systems or teaching five different systems for sort of understanding yeah. like Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs and things like that. Uh, in, in all of these systems, it seems like there's, there's an element of truth, but then there's always these dangers. And it's not necessarily... Uh, because the the model isn't true, but it's how it gets used by people or the ways that it gets sort of distorted or often weaponized, I would say. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the dangers or cautions that you might give about this system and how people uh, approach it and use it as they're, as they're maybe digging deeper and trying to understand uh, spiral dynamics? Sure. Um one of them is to do with the way that it's been taught. And historically, when people go do a course in spiral dynamics, one of the first things that people are taught is the, the value systems, right? Uh, and, mm-hmm. it, and it's generally in the past been taught as a staged developmental process. And mm-hmm. the danger is that people are often attracted to understanding those value systems as like pigeonholes. And they want to put mm-hmm. they want to put things in the pigeonholes, and they'll think of somebody right. they know and say, "Oh, yeah, that that person goes in this green pigeonhole, <laughs> and that person goes in the blue pigeonhole." And what about that system or that book I read? Oh, yeah, that goes in that pigeonhole, and and that is a, a misunderstanding of the system. Um, 
what mm. I've done over the years is I've changed the sequence that I teach it in. And I, I teach people about the change experience first, because that naturally mm. takes them through the pathway of being, you know, starting on one uh, level of complexity and finishing on a new level of complexity. So they get an mm. understanding that it's actually, that's a journey from one place to the next. Mm. Um, and I say the best way to think about value systems is as windows that you look through at the world. So rather than mm-hmm. thinking that they're boxes that you put things in, you think that each value system is a different window and you get a different perspective when you look through that window. And so you can take a person or a system or an object and look at it through a number of different windows and you'll see it differently. And through some of those windows, in other words, value systems, you might like it from, you know, other ones you might dislike it. <laughs> So, mm-hmm. so just mm-hmm. think of it as like windows or maybe even a set of glasses that you put on to give you a different perspective on the world. Um, and, you know, in truth, that change from switching from one window or set of glasses to the next is actually happening at the deepest level, uh, the frameworks that we have for making sense of reality, you know, at a very, very deep subconscious place that we can't really get in touch with. But, uh, but that's the most common uh, error uh, that I see people making with spiral dynamics is they want to pigeonhole people and things into the value systems. Um, mm-hmm. the, this, one of the second biggest issues I've come across is a misunderstanding of the nature of second tier consciousness. And mm-hmm. even Ken Wilber has um, suffered from this over the years. And it's come from the fact that when they first developed written assessments, online assessments in particular for um, spiral dynamics, they, when they wrote the, the um, multiple choice questions for turquoise, they wrote them in mm-hmm. such a way that they were really attractive to somebody who was operating from the green value system, layer six. Mm-hmm. And so a whole bunch of people who were actually uh, situated around the green value system as their dominant value system and suddenly thought they were turquoise. And so they suddenly mm-hmm. thought that they were second tier and it threw out their calibration of the whole spiral because they looked back on uh, orange and below as if they were first tier and they thought green was second tier. And, I mean, in their own mind, they thought they were turquoise, right? They didn't think they were green. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's, been a, that's had a huge impact globally and I still see it. Like I, I go so far as saying most sources that you look at on the internet, they talk about, uh, spiral dynamics suffer from this issue of, of mistaking green for yellow. Um, mm. And uh, mm. yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's an ongoing issue and it's something that I, I, I guess you're, are you aware of the change code book that just came out? Is, um, yeah, actually I'm, I'm uh, going to be interviewing Monica Bourgeau yeah, that's, uh, later, that's, that's later this year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Monica uh, asked me to review the book before it was published and I managed to correct that issue uh in her book so uh, that's one source yeah. that i can point to that's that's solid in this respect yeah yeah and i mean it goes back to what we were saying earlier about green and how it, green has these it, i i guess because it's sort of you know it's this edge case uh this like uh liminal space right it's it's at the end of tier one yeah where you kind of think like oh yeah well we've really we've really arrived and yeah aren't aren't we so much better than everything that came before and so it's it it has this flavor of being really easy to think like we're we're a lot further along maybe than we are and not and not always uh willing to look at what the what some of the drawbacks or or problematic parts of that that yeah. layer are yeah yeah there's another relationship within the value systems that uh, as far as i know clear growth never documented but i it's come out uh, in later years as people have understood the model more. Um, and that is there's a shadow relationship amongst the value systems and it works three layers down. So um, they say generally mm. a person will be spread across about three value systems. There'll be one, which is your dominant value system. There'll be the previous one, which maybe you still got a part of you, you know, working in. And mm. then there'll be the next one, which you're just starting to push into. So you kind of spread across roughly three different value systems. Um, That's Mm -hmm. a generalization. Um, And whatever your dominant value system is, its shadow will be three steps down. So if you're at six, then your shadow is layer three, which is egocentric, right? Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, and so that's yeah. why we see a lot of egocentric behavior in new age communities and general people who are, mm. who are operating from that layer six. And it's a, it's a shadow aspect. So they don't realize it themselves, but they're mm-hmm. playing, they're mm-hmm. playing out a lot of egocentric stuff without knowing it. And, and one of the most mm-hmm. obvious examples or evidence of this in the world is the selfie, right? Look how the selfie has grown mm. <laughs> uh, with the with the growth of layer six and social media. It's like, look at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's very it's very interesting. And and so you can look at the other data system in the same way. So uh, Orange Five, the shadow is two, which is tribalism, and you get tribalism within corporates, right? Um, oh, yeah. And uh-huh. the shadow uh-huh. of four is layer one. And, you know, when layer four was uh, sailing around the world and, and conquering new countries, um, you know, like the Spanish and South America mm. and stuff, um, their shadow was layer one. So they didn't, when they came across people at layer one, they didn't even regard them as human. They, they saw them as savages and wanted to kill them, you know. Mm. We, I, ironically, mm. wanted to kill them, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I feel like that's a whole episode in itself, just yeah, unpacking totally, yeah, it's how, how colonization was really uh, us attacking our shadow yeah. as, a, as a species almost. Yeah, wow. exactly. exactly <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, you've been very generous uh, with your time. Um, I, I'm thinking of calling the closing segment I've been doing getting out and getting deeper because I want people to always have like uh, something they can do and then some resources and recommendations to go deeper. So um, we both want to recommend things where people can get out and people can get deeper. Um, well, there's a lot we've already recommended and I've been taking taking notes and putting things in the show notes, but... Um, I want to recommend that people uh, spend some time. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they need to go back. If if this is your first experience or your first encounter with Spiral Dynamics, uh, maybe just go back and re-listen because it it's a lot to take in and um, it can be a, a, a bit overwhelming. Yeah, maybe maybe just re-listening to that and um, observing it. it Getting out, sometimes I feel like action steps are always about making change, but sometimes a good action step is about observation. I, I'm a permaculture fan, and so you know that's one of the, the main uh, key components of permaculture is right to observe. Um, and I think Claire Graves gets a lot of wisdom and insight from all of the observation and research. So uh, maybe the action step I want to suggest to people is just uh, observe. <laughs> don't get too don't get too excited, but uh, listen again to all the the good stuff Steve was sharing, and then um, get out and and just watch in the world and see what you notice in in what you're reading and what you're listening to. Um, and then going deeper, uh, I mentioned to Steve uh, before the show that I read a book by Ken Wilber last year called The Theory of Everything, I believe, which is sort of a, I think, summation of a lot of his work that's a, a lot, goes a lot deeper. Um, and as you said, there are some things where people aren't, aren't, there's some, some debates and arguments about what Kim Wilber gets right and gets wrong. Uh, but I highly recommend that book for, um, an entry point to Ken Wilber and an entry point to a lot of these different things where he's looking at a lot of these systems like spiral dynamics and trying to, connect the dots um in a way that that helps us to see maybe see the world in a more complete way i don't think he's claiming it's fully complete but um uh, i highly recommend ken wilber's uh, the theory of everything so steve uh what do you want to tell people to to get out and how can they go deeper um i'd just like to firstly yeah, say that i found ken wilber's work extremely valuable so you know in in my early years of trying to make sense of uh, the spiral and Claire Graves' model, um, Ken Wilber's work and his, his structure around integral theory and the AQUAL structure mm-hmm. was really, really useful for me. Um, it made a huge difference. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of his work uh, and I find his books difficult to read. <laughs> so what I, what I did was I sw- swapped over to the audio sets oh, there you go. Yeah. and there's a company called uh, Sound, SoundsTrue.com. They put out Ken Wilber audio sets where he's being interviewed and talking about his stuff and I find that much easier to digest. Yeah. So I just offer that as yeah, an option that's a as great well. Tip. Um, in terms of my recommended action step, uh, as I was explaining, one of the characteristics of 
all of the first tier value systems is this tendency to reject uh, different value sets. Mm -hmm. So I just invite people to notice when that rejection factor comes up inside them, you know, just day to day as they're interacting with other people, maybe when they're watching stuff on, on uh, the internet yeah. or on television or whatever they do. Um, and, and often it'll show up as anxiety or fear too. Mm. Um, so just, just notice that and pause for a moment and just reflect on, okay, um, the possibility that you're bumping into a different set of values here. And um, it's not that, something is inherently bad or a person is inherently wrong. It may just be that they're operating from a different value set, which values different things has different motivations, different behaviors. And um, with that kind of practice, it helps you sort of work yourself into that witnessing state where, you know, rather than getting kind of buffeted by the turbulence of life, you're kind of noticing those bumps, but you're just standing back and looking at it as an observer. And that's really good. Um, material for self-development mm -hmm. and it will help with the transition into second tier consciousness if you can go yeah. that way well steve where can people find you on the internet and i will include links to um your website and stuff and your podcast in the show notes but tell people where they can find you yeah cool so um i have a blog called emanate e-m-a-n number eight dot net and I'll, I'll give you the link to that lucas uh which has got a bunch of public talks that I've done over the years, uh, some with video. Um, there's some really basic information about Graves' model on there, uh, some some uh, images that I probably need to update to uh, from, from thinking about it on this talk. Um, but that's my blog. I, my change agency is uh, org. Uh, and uh, I also do that um, weekly podcast that you mentioned called Future Sense. There's a site for that, futuresense.it. Uh, and that's got links out to Apple and Android podcast platforms. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, uh, I'm pretty sure this is going to have to be a two-parter because you are very generous with your time and uh, your knowledge, and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share with us today, Steve. Thanks, Lucas. I really enjoyed talking to you. It's been a, a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today on We Don't Talk About That with Lucas Land. If you like what you hear, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. Help us spread the word by sharing it on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the handle at WDTAT Podcast. You can also rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can support the podcast by visiting our website at wdtatpodcast.com and clicking on support. You can make a one-time donation or consider becoming a monthly supporter through Patreon. You'll receive bonus content and access to patron-only benefits. Thanks for your support. We would love to hear from you. Leave us a voicemail by going to our website and clicking send voicemail. Your voicemail could be featured in a future episode. You can also email us at wdtatpodcast at gmail.com. Many thanks to Neil Curran and Infielder for the use of their music. You can find more of their music online at infielder.bandcamp.com. A final thought from Brené Brown. The willingness to show up changes us. It makes us a little braver each time. Until next time, keep showing up and keep being brave. What are you gonna do?